All right, welcome back. We are on part four, responding to the critics. And um, so this is the newest one. I, I actually did a one, like I said, a video on uh, four verses that show the Book of Mormon to be false, in which I talked about there is a contradiction between the Bible and the Book of Mormon, in which it is a case that Adam was not deceived, according to the Bible, but our the Book of Mormon has our first parents were beguiled. Our first parents were deceived. And so that would be the case that there's a contradiction between those two. Anyways, um, he says, uh, Laugh out loud, you actually say the most probable origin of the Book of Mormon was Solomon Spalding and Sidney Rigdon. My brother in Christ, the Solomon Spalding theory has been put to bed. <laughs> yeah, some people think that, uh, actually. How do you explain Sidney Rigdon authoring the Book of Mormon when he was in a different state and never met Joseph Smith until after he read the Book of Mormon? And that's a good question uh, because um, this man here, uh, he had not read, or sorry, he had not watched our videos yet. And it's true. I mean, it's true that, um, that Sidney Rigdon did live in Ohio while Joseph Smith was in New York. That, that's not... That's not in debate. Um, the question is, you know, as we saw in our last video, there were witnesses who claimed that Sidney Rigdon and Solomon Spalding, uh, sorry, Sidney Rigdon and Joseph Smith did actually have some meetings together before his conversion in November of 1830. Uh, he says, I also chuckle at your opening 15 minutes of very softball type arguments to try and prove there are no contradictions in the Bible, where... We both know there are much more valid contradiction arguments in the Bible. Now, whether he's saying here that there are contradictions in the Bible, um, I would first ask him to please show us one. Please show us if there, where there is a contradiction. And the second thing that he hasn't done yet, um, from what I've seen, is he has not disproved the, contra the contradiction that I found between the Bible and the Book of Mormon. So he needs to disprove that. Now, interesting enough, you know, he talks about, oh, you know, Sidney Rigdon, you know, and how he could not have authored the Book of Mormon. But what's really interesting to me, uh, this is from the Journal of Discourses. Um, and notice the title of this. This is in April of 1884. So it's, you know, one of those uh, talks that was given. Notice it says, Predictions in the Book of Mormon, evidence of its divinity, proof that Joseph Smith was inspired, predictions concerning the Indian's fulfillment, uh, fulfilled, coming forth of the Book of Mormon foretold, plainness of its teachings, prediction relating to Sidney Rigdon, and so forth. So, interesting, uh, we're just going to go to this one section that Mr. Cannon talks about. And he says this for the following. Another most remarkable prediction is given in the same chapter you saw about 2 Nephi chapter 3, showing how plainly the Lord revealed to his ancient servants who wrote this book that which should take place in the last times. Lehi, in speaking about Moses, said that the Lord had revealed to Joseph the patriarch that he would raise up a mighty prophet named Moses and that he would, should raise up for him a spokesman, that Moses would not be mighty in word but in deed. Here is what the Lord said unto Joseph the patriarch as quoted by Lehi. And the Lord said unto me also, that is Joseph the patriarch, I will raise up unto you the fruit of thy loins, and I will make for him a spokesman. And I, behold, what I will give unto him, that he shall write the writing of the fruit of thy loins unto the fruit of thy loins, and the spokesman of thy loins shall declare it. After the church had been organized some months, Oliver Cowdery, Parley Pratt, Peter Whitmer, and Ziba Peterson, were appointed by the prophet of God to visit the western boundaries of Missouri. On their journey westward, they passed through the western part of Ohio, where Parley had formerly lived and labored in connection with the Reformed Baptists. They called upon one of the founders of that sect, Sidney Rigdon. They found him in the town of Kirtland, gave him a book of Mormon, and bore their testimony to him of the restoration of the gospel. Sidney Rigdon said to them, You tell me a strange tale. I will examine this book, and he commenced to do so. They were all young men. Sidney Rigdon was many years their senior. Rigdon examined the book and became convinced that it was the Word of God. He was baptized in the town of Kirtland, 
and the foundation of a great work was laid there. God afterwards revealed that this man was to be a spokesman, and he became a spokesman to this people and to the world for the prophet Joseph. Those who knew Sidney Reardon know how wonderfully God inspired him, and with what wonderful eloquence he declared the word of God to the people. He was a mighty man in the hands of God as a spokesman, as long as the prophet lived or up to a short time before his death. Thus you see that even this, which many might look upon as a small matter, was predicted about 1,700 years before the birth of the Savior, and was quoted by Lehi 600 years before the same event, and about 2,400 years before its fulfillment, and was translated by the power of God through his servant Joseph, as was predicted should be the case. And at a time, uh, as I have said, when there was not a man upon the earth who was a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the church had not yet been organized. Joseph did not know unless he knew by the spirit of revelation whether any man would receive the gospel. I doubt whether he knew as to how the church would be organized. He had some idea, doubtless, but there was many things which he himself did not know till he wrote this translation. So you can see there that George Cannon claimed, uh, the, the, the Latter-day Saints claim him to be an apostle, okay? Now, this, this ain't some, so to speak, quack job. This ain't some, you know, um, this guy, it says, if you look on the official LDS website, among the best-known Latter-day Saints during the 19th century, George Q. Cannon served as an editor and publisher, business educator, member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, and, and so on and so forth. Okay? Now, down here, in it, look what it says here. In 1860, Brigham Young, which would be their second prophet, ordained George Q. Cannon an apostle and assigned him to preside over the European mission. So that's in 1860. Now, remember that the this was given in 1884, okay? So that's 24 years later. So, interesting enough, um, this is from the, um, the, so to speak, official YouTube pay, uh, page of the, of the LDS Church. You can watch where they talk about apostle, and they say that apostle is a special witness of Jesus Christ. Okay. So this would mean, if they really desire to uh, want there to be restored apostles as found in the first century church, then these verses have to apply, right? Because Jesus, in John 13 through 16, is speaking to his disciples who would become known as the apostles. And Jesus says, these things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Chapter 15. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. You also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. Chapter 16. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, Jesus said. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. If I depart... I will not send him to you, and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because they go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because a ruler of this world is, cat, is judge. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But however, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you not all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but wherever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of that what is just mine and declare it to you. So, what I'm trying to say is this, is that George Cannon, if he is an apostle, of, as, as they claim, then he was, so to speak, inspired of God. And what he said here would be, the, would be claimed as the truth of the interpretation of that passage in 2 Nephi chapter 3. And that the spokesman is actually referring to Sidney Rigdon. Why am I bringing all this up? Because here's the thing. Here's the interesting thing. And this is what you learn in those 35 videos. And there's a, a true historical event that happened. Uh, Martin Harris was a scribe with Joseph Smith when the Book of Mormon was being translated. 
around 116 pages were translated, and Martin Harris took uh, most of the pages, not all of the pages, but most of them. Uh, we, we know because there obviously was a few pages left, it seems like. Um, but he took them, and somehow they, they ended up be, being lost or destroyed or disappearing. Something happened to them. We don't know exactly. Uh, it seems that maybe Lucy, uh, Martin's wife, had destroyed them. We, we don't know it for certain. But this created a crisis for Joseph Smith. And Joseph Smith would have had to try probably using Oliver Cowdery to go fetch Sidney Rigdon in order to try to figure out what they're going to do in this situation. So you can, you can really see this, my friends, um, when you look at the series of videos which we've, which we've done. And that is that you remember that pretty much LDS scholars uh, agree that when Joseph Smith started to begin the translation process again, he started near Mosiah near the beginning of Mosiah, and he continued his way in that direction. And when you look at Mosiah, and you look at Alma, and you look at Helaman, you can, you can really see, to me anyways, you can see Solomon Spalding's fingerprints, especially in Alma. Um, because, I mean, chapter 41 through, I think, 63, I mean, just be, look at it honestly. And tell me that that's, that wasn't probably some of the original pages of manuscript found that was edited a little bit. But anyways, uh, what I'm trying to say is, so they, you know, they finish up that part from Mosiah through um, probably, most likely, um, well, whatever the book is before Ether. I think 4th Nephi. Anyways. So, you know, here there's that, that missing part, right? Those missing 116 pages, right? There's a big go big gap between what we call 1st Nephi and Mo Mosiah. So, they have to fill in that gap there. And it makes sense that Rigdon, who had learned some truth, he did learn some truth, such as baptism. Um, he incorporated that into, uh, from Messiah, um, through those, he incorporated that some, but he also, um, it would, it was incorporated in from first Nephi through Mosiah. And you can see how in second Nephi, which is definitely very heavily edited because here they, you know, add a lot of Isaiah to it to fill in a gap, so to speak. Uh, it's a, uh, to me, it's a lot of filler material. But you also have Sidney Rigdon putting his signature, you know, very, very vaguely, though, that he is that spokesman. You know, because he's going to be the one that's going to be a part of this new religious movement. So... Um, you know, it, 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 that's to me an internal evidence that Sidney Rigdon is originally a part of transforming manuscript found into the Book of Mormon is that piece right there. Instead of it being a supposed prophecy, as uh, George Q. Cannon asserts here. Um, and then, so... I want to take what Winder says in different stages because it would have taken a lot to write all of this out. And um, I do want to respond to him uh, very cordially. And so, Windler, I hope that you see my love for you um, and why I'm giving it to you in this way. So he says, um, we're just going to take it paragraph by paragraph. So I've taken your advice of watching these and he's referring to uh, my 35 videos. And I hope that Wendler, I hope you do watch them all. I really do. You'll see the connection of evidence. But anyways, uh, 
So I've taken your advice of watching these since you seem to think your argument is convincing. And my friend, you completely missed the mark on many things. You seem to be under the impression that if you make a good enough argument using the wisdom of man mingled with scripture, somehow this will convince a member of the church of Jesus Christ of that we are wrong. The one thing you failed to grasp, I'm guessing through this entire series, is that a member of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is spiritually convinced through the Holy Spirit of God and the truthfulness of the things in the, the Bible and the Book of Mormon. So frankly, this opening is not off to a great start. However, I made some observations at various timestamps of your video. So, yes, that is, uh, I mean, I, I I did know, Wendler, about your philosophy of turning over to Moroni chapter 10 and praying about the Book of Mormon and whether and God revealing that it's going to be truthful. Or, um, so, here's the thing. So, he says... Um, using the wisdom of man mingled with scripture. Well, friend, you have to recognize that God wants man to use his mind to, um, he wants him to use the law of rationality that we should only believe things that are justified by the evidence. And I would suggest that you please uh, there, go to the apologetxpress.org and read is Christianity logical part one and part two, and you'll it will show you that Jesus was the master logician. He he taught he he taught us how to think, how to reason together. I think it's very interesting about what Jesus did. So I'm not, you know, using the wisdom of a man mingled with scripture because. Jesus did this in Matthew 22, for example. Um, you know, he put, for example, the um, Pharisees into a dilemma when he said, the baptism of John, where was it from? From heaven, from men. And they said, well, if we say it was from heaven, then um, then all people are going to, um, well, yeah, I'm trying to think of what they said there. In Matthew. So let me get that real quick. Sorry, I'm. Uh, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him, believe John? But if we say from men, we fear the multitude, for all count John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus and said, We do not know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. All right, so, all right, next thing is also this I want you to think about. And I thought Brother Dave Miller said it in a better way than I can. So he says, how may a person distinguish between truth and error? Can a person know which religion, if any, is right? Must a person rely on subjective inner inclinations and feelings? Or is religious truth ascertainable and knowable based on objective assessment? Some religions, Buddhism and Hinduism, base their credibility on some mystical or transcendental experience. Even some so-called Christian groups claim that their credibility and authenticity may be established on the basis of the Holy Spirit whom they say give them their assurance. Now let me stop there for a moment. Because... If you put a Mormon, if you put a Pentecostal, and I, know, and I know there's different Pentecostal groups, but I'm just speaking in gener gen generalizations here, if you don't mind. And even a Calvinist or something like that, you put those people together, how are each of them going to say, even though they teach, they, they, they do teach different doctrines, and yet each of them will claim hold of, well, the Holy Spirit revealed this to me. You see how this subjectivity is, this mysticism, it's, it's very irrational. And so even some Christian groups claim that their credibility, um, some Christian groups claim that their credibility and authenticity may, may be established on the basis of the Holy Spirit, whom they say gives them this, their assurance. But when the Bible is examined, and this is very important. No such role is assigned to the Holy Spirit. 
Mystical religions have always existed and have insisted that they are the recipients of leading and guidance from superior forces that are better felt than told. The God of the Bible, on the other hand, always offers evidence, proof of the divine origin of the message before he expected people to believe. The nature of truth is such that it does not depend upon subjective human experience for its veracity. Rather, God created human beings with minds that were designed to function rationally, part of what it means to be created in the image of God. We humans have the capability, if we maintain an honest heart, free from bias, to consider and weigh evidence and to draw correct conclusions. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 32. The truthfulness of religious claims is verifiable on the basis of evidence and rational thought. Humans have the capacity, capability, and responsibility to reason logically and distinguish between truth and falsehood. Now, let me give you an example of this. You go to Acts chapter 2. What does Peter do? Peter gives evidence. He first, he says, you know, um, you know why you hear and see this miraculous phenomenon? Why the apostles were speaking in different languages they've never studied before? And he says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. And he quotes from Joel 2 and says, this is a fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy. That's evidence, my friends. And then Peter quotes from Psalm 16. He says, you know, you see David over there? Uh, you know, David is the one who was inspired to write Psalm 16. You're, he says, you know, you're my soul. Um, let me go there because I want to quote this correctly. In Acts chapter 2. Um, sorry, you know, one more thing before that. The second piece of evidence is that Peter points to men of Israel. Hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by miracles, signs, and wonders, as God did through him, as you yourselves also know. You see, you know that he did miracles, and miracles show him to be a true messenger of God. And then he quotes verses 25 through 28 from Psalm 16. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Well, David, his body's there, has been corrupted for a millennia, a thousand B.C. Um, and so, you see here that David, uh, sorry, Peter says, that's not referring to David. David was speaking concerning his descendant, the Christ. And that Jesus would rise from the dead and just fulfill another prophecy in the Old Testament. Then you see his case that he Jesus fulfilled Psalm 110. And then Peter says, we are eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Christ. So you see the evidence that Peter presents and that we're to draw a reasonable and rational conclusion based upon that evidence. So... That's something that we need to think about. All right, your major claim at 416, um, he's referring to my video of the first video of where did the Book of Mormon come from, if you want to look at what I said. Your major claim at 416, which you're trying to prove, is that the Book of Mormon is man-made. Why are you relying on the wisdom of man to determine this? Why don't you ask God himself? So I wanted to uh, talk about logic already. Um, so he's referring to Moroni chapter 10. And the one thing that I want to say with regards to this is, let's just say I did pray. And what if God did reveal to me that the Book of Mormon was false? Would you then leave the Latter-day Saint religion? I mean, you see, that we get into this subjective realm here. See, it's very subjective. We need to go to think to an objective standard. At 5.32... Now, he says, I poke fun of the young elders, but the reason they call, can call themselves elders is the same um, way. Let me see if I, yeah, is the same way uh, the 12 were able to preach the gospel to the Gentiles 
when before they had specifically been told not to is through continuous revelation through prophets and apostles. Now, I mem- remember I mentioned in those videos to watch how do we know that an elder, pastor, and bishop is referring to the same work or a elder, shepherd, or elder, uh, shepherd or pastor, or bishop and or overseer. <laughs> those are all words that could be translated that way. And you can see here, friends, just for example, on in Acts 20, verse 28, there on the left, therefore take heed to yourselves, to all the flock, which, which Paul had been talking to, the elders of the church at Ephesus, in which he says, and which the Holy Spirit has made you bishops, made you overseers, episcopos, episcopus. And so you see there that elders are also interchangeably known as bishops. But in the Latter-day Saint organizational uh, structure, a bishop is higher than an elder. So there's, a, there's, there's two different offices. But in the original church, there, there's only one office that is of an elder, pastor, and or uh, bishop. And then there's the what we call the deacons. All right, you uh, six thirteen. You mentioned that whatever church you belong to. Well, uh, I belong to the Lord's Church. Just to let you know, uh, it has a more biblical organizational structure. You don't realize how funny this sounds to a member of a church that not only has bishops and elders, but is led by a prophet and apostles, which I guarantee your church is severely lacking in. Well, actually, we do have apostles. Those apostles, their writings is found in the Word of God. The apostles and prophets, their inspired writings is found in the Bible. We're built on, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is built on the solid foundation of Jesus. Him being the Christ. Him being that chief cornerstone. And so, um, that's what I want to say in regards to that. I want to say that I would welcome you to please watch our series on miracles where we discuss that because if you really do have apostles today, then let me read to you from my book, which you can find online for free, worldevangelismlibrary.org, in which you have to have some necessary conditions if you're really to have apostles today. So let me just read some of this here. The LDS denomination sought to restore the office of apostleship. Yet the New Testament teaches that it was a temporary office in the church, as will be seen from the necessary conditions. In order for the LDS denomination to restore the office of apostleship, then it must restore the necessary conditions that are established by the New Testament itself. If the apostolic office was restored through the Latter-day Saints, then the apostolic office requires necessary conditions. The first necessary condition was that apostles were to be eyewitnesses of the risen Lord Christ. Have the modern day LDS apostles seen the risen Christ? The second necessary condition was that the apostles were called and chosen by Christ personally. The third necessary condition was that the apostles were given the gospel by immediate revelation by means of the Holy Spirit. The fourth necessary condition was that the apostles had a commission of universal authority. The fifth necessary condition was the apostles had power to work miracles, to attest their commission, and to confirm the truth of their doctrine. The sixth necessary condition was the apostles had the power to impart miraculous gifts on those on whom they laid their hands. And the seventh necessary condition was the apostles built the church on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Now, friends, with number five and number six, you cannot get around this. But I would like to see honestly see the so-called apostles in the LDS church lay their hands on someone so that they are imparting them a miraculous gift that is as what we see recorded there in New Testament times. But friends, you're just not going to have that. 819, you claim that the major reason we can trust the Bible is due to the many self-fulfilling prophecies it contains. If that is a criteria, then the Book of Mormon counts as it has over 150 of these as well. 
Well, yes, uh, you'll see in the Book of Mormon that there are prophecies in the sense of that they mostly imitate the Bible. Um, to give you an example, um, I guess you could think about First Nephi, uh, I think 10 through 14. Like it talks about John the Baptist coming and stuff like that, which it's just giving what the Bible has already given. So it's just copying what the Bible said. But what's really interesting to me is it does get some prophecies wrong. Micah 5, 2 clearly says Jesus will be born in Bethlehem. But in Alma 7, verse 10, it says that Jesus will be born in, in Jerusalem, the land of our forefathers. Jesus was not born at Jerusalem. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And you see how the Bible writers always were precise and got it correct, unlike the Book of Mormon. You claim that we should be able to use the Bible instead of the Book of Mormon, but that is a horrible premise for a question. If I asked you, could we only use the Old Testament instead of the full Bible, would you say yes? The question shouldn't be how little Scripture can we get away with using, but really, why shouldn't we use all the Scripture God has given us? Speaking of self-fulfilling Book of Mormon prophecies, well, once again, you're asserting that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. You have to prove it's the Word of God. But um, when we think about the Bible, and it's 66 books, and you see the unity of the Bible, and it's in the types and the shadows, and how they fulfilled in the substance and the sh and the and the sub um, and the uh, antitypes, and how you see how from Genesis to Revelation the plan of God is truly f f revealed in that it starts with interesting the creation starts with marriage and how it ends with the new creation, how it ends with a marriage, the ultimate marriage of Christ and his bride, the lamb, um, and his bride, the, the lamb's wife. So I find that very interesting. The Bible does that. And then, you know, you have 1,800 years later when supposedly another revelation comes, but that revelation contradicts previous revelation. It contradicts the Bible. So, that's why the scripture, and, and I've asked Larry Saints, am I okay with, with the, just the Bible? And to my knowledge, I mean, I've had every Mormon say, yes, then, then why do we need the Book of Mormon? And that's an honest question to ask. All right. At 1140, you claim if you fell away from the church, if I, if I was part of the Larry Saint Church, and that you would go to outer darkness is incorrect because, from my understanding, from studying their doctrine, if you become a Latter-day Saint and you apostatize, then you go to outer darkness. But he says um, that's incorrect based upon the criteria for entering outer darkness. Most likely you would go to the terrestrial kingdom from the little I can extrapolate from you and how you probably live your life. Uh, but fortunately, the final judgment is something only God has to worry about. So, interesting enough, in one of their uh, tracks, so they believe in what's called three kingdoms of glory, or degrees of glory. So they say the celestial kingdom, are uh, the highest kingdom, our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ reside in the celestial kingdom. If you live according to the gospel of Jesus Christ and are cleansed from sin by the atonement, you will receive a place in this the higher kingdom, you will live in God's presence and know complete joy. Terrestrial kingdom, which he said I was going to belong in. Uh, people who refuse to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ, but who live honorable lives, will receive a place in the terrestrial kingdom. Telestial kingdom, those who continue in their sins and do not repent, will receive a place in the telestial kingdom. Um, for some reason, I do not know why they do not have outer darkness on here. But, but if you look at their YouTube channel, official YouTube channel, they talk about this. The five minute uh, to five minute and thirty minute, five minutes to five thirty. Um, the narrator actually says a place, uh, outer darkness, defining it, a place of no glory at all where Satan dwells, it is reserved for the very few. Now notice this, notice this very carefully, who once had a full understanding of truth and personal witness of the Savior. And that's what, uh, I mean, if we think about it, that's what def a Mormon is. 
Jesus Christ, but who subsequently renounce and abandon that personal witness, only the ev- most evil people are assigned to hell as the final destination. So I can't help but see here that if I did become a Mormon and apostatized and rejected that personal witness, then I would be heading for outer darkness. That's why I made that conclusion. But he's well, he's welcome to correct me. All that being said, I'm still uh, reeling from how badly you have cherry-picked Scripture from 13.1 and basically the end of the video. I'm gathering my notes because this deserves a separate post in of itself, in, a, in unto itself, to really state what my post is going to be about. You also believe the prophets of the Old Testament didn't understand what this, who the Savior was. Well, what I was discussing was the mystery of God, and, and I would want everyone to watch part one. Because when you read the Old Testament, the mystery was concealed. Um, and it's very interesting. Um, yes, there are lots and lots of prophecies, no doubt about that. But I kind of use what's called, and the only way I can say it is veiled language. Like, to give you an example of this, like, if we didn't have the New Testament, I wouldn't be able to see the corresponding fulfillments. Um, so, for example, um, if I go to Psalm 22, which definitely is about the crucifixion of Jesus, but when it says, you know, they d- divided my garments among them, okay? Well, when I go to the Gospel of John and I see the Roman soldiers dividing the garments of Christ, ah, Okay, I see that. The veil has been, so to speak, uh, been moved away, has been removed. Um, and there's many things like that. I mean, think about the Ethiopian eunuch. He was reading Isaiah 53, and Philip preached unto him Jesus. And no doubt Philip was showing him the life of Christ, how that corresponded to Old Testament prophecies there. And he, the light would turn on, so to speak. You know, um, so there was a mystery and the mystery was finally revealed in the first century AD in which it revealed that the Jews and the Gentiles could be heirs of the same kingdom. Uh, and that's something that we need to recognize. And so what the Book of Mormon does, though, is what I was trying to explain is Paul says, This is revealed in the first century. But when you, if we take the Book of Mormon timeline, 600 BC, Nephi and Lehi and all them, they're revealing the mystery of God before the first century AD. And so that's a major contradiction. So that's one of the things I was trying to bring out in that. So I um, hope out of all this, I'm not trying to my my uh, goal is not about winning arguments here. My goal is to reach people with the love of Christ, to reach them with the truth, to reach you with the truth, because I love you, and God loves you. God cares for you, and God wants you to come out of this error that you have sadly been entrapped by. And some of us don't see that we're entrapped in error, but... You know, I only want to speak the truth in love because I want what's best for everyone. I want them to be saved. And so I hope that that's what you see, that that's my motive. Um, so I love, uh, I do love you, and I want you to come to the knowledge of the truth, Just and God wants you to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so I really appreciate being with you. I'm really um, thankful. And um, that's all we have for today, and if we have any more Uh, responses to my videos. We'll make those along the way. So really appreciate being with you today. I hope you have a blessed day. Bye-bye.